Thomas Paine by John Watts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Thomas Paine by John Watts. The wise, by some centuries before the crowd, must, by their novel systems, though correct, of course offend the wicked, weak, and proud, must meet with hatred, calumny, neglect. Thomas Paine, the sturdy champion of political and religious liberty, was born at Thetford in the county of Norfolk, England, 29th of January, 1737. Born of religious parents, his father being a Quaker and his mother a member of the Church of England, Paine received a religious education at Thetford Grammar School under the Rev. William Knowles. At an early age he gave indications of his great talent, and found pleasure, when a boy, in studying poetical authors. His parents, however, endeavored to check his taste for poetry his father probably thinking it would unfit him for the denomination to which he belonged. But Paine did not lose much time before experimenting in poetry himself. Hence we find him, when eight years of age, composing the following epitaph, upon a fly being caught in a spider's web. Here lies the body of John Crow, who once was high, but now is low. Ye brother crows, take warning all. For as you rise, so must you fall. At the age of thirteen, after receiving a moderate education in reading, writing, and arithmetic, Paine left school to follow his father's trade, stay-making. Although disliking the business, he pursued this avocation for nearly five years. When about twenty years of age, however, he felt, as most enterprising young men do feel, a desire to visit London and enter into the competition and chances of a metropolitan life. His natural dislike to his father's business led him to abandon for a period his original occupation, and after working some time with Mr. Morris, a noted staymaker in Longacre, he resolved upon a seafaring adventure of which he thus speaks. At an early age, raw, adventurous, and heated with the false heroism of a master, Reverend Mr. Knowles, master of the grammar school at Thetford, who had served in a man-of-war, I began my fortune and entered on board the terrible Captain Death. From this adventure I was happily prevented by the affectionate and moral remonstrances of a good father whom from the habits of his life, being of the Quaker profession, looked on me as lost but the impression, much as it affected me at the time, wore away, and I entered afterwards in the King of Prussia privateer, Captain Mender, and went with her to sea. Sea life did not, as may be supposed, long satisfy a mind like Paine's. In April 1759, after working nearly twelve months at Dover, we find him settled as Master Staymaker at Sandwich, marrying on September 27th Mary Lambert, daughter of an excise man of that place. But his matrimonial happiness was of short duration, his wife dying the following year. Disgusted with the toil and inconvenience of his late occupation, Payne now renounced it forever, to apply himself to the profession of exciseman. After fourteen months' study he obtained the appointment of supernumerary in the excise, which he held with intervals till 1768, when he settled as exciseman at Lewis in Sussex, and married 1771 Elizabeth Olive, daughter of a tobacconist, whose business he succeeded to. About this time Paine wrote several little pieces in prose and verse, among which was the celebrated song on the death of General Wolfe, and the trial of Farmer Carter's dog Porter. The latter is a composition of exquisite wit and humor. In 1772 the excise officers throughout the kingdom were dissatisfied with their salaries, and formed a plan to apply to Parliament for an increase. Payne, being distinguished among them as a man of great talent, was solicited to draw up and state their case, 
which he did in a pamphlet entitled The Case of the Salary of the Officers of Excise, and Thoughts on the Corruption Arising from the Poverty of Excise Officers. Four thousand copies of this pamphlet were printed and circulated. Some time after this publication, Payne, being in the grocery business, was suspected of unfair practices, and was dismissed the excise, after being in it twelve years. This suspicion, however, was never shown to be just, but to show how very vigorous the authorities were in suppressing smuggling, we will quote the following letter from Cleo Rickman to the editor of the Independent Whig in October 1807. Sir, if there are any characters more to be abhorred than others, it is those who inflict severe punishments against offenders, and yet themselves commit the same crimes. If any characters more than others deserve execration, exposure, and to be driven from among mankind, it is those governors of the people who break the laws they themselves make, and punish others for breaking. Suffer me, Mr. Editor, thus to preface the following fact fact, I say, because I stand ready to prove it so. When Admiral Duncan rendezvoused in the Downs with his fleet on the 8th of January, 1806, the spider-lugger, Daniel Falara, master, was sent to Guernsey to smuggle articles for the fleet, such as wine, spirits, hair-powder, playing cards, tobacco, etc., for the supply of the different ships. At her arrival in the Downs, the ship's boats flocked round her to unload her and her contraband cargo. A custom-house extra boat, commanded by William Wallace, seeing the lugger, followed and took her, in doing which he did his duty. On his inspecting the smuggled articles with which she was laden, he found a number of cases directed to Admiral Duncan, the Right Honorable William Pitt, the heaven-born Minister of England, and to the Right Honorable Henry Dundas, Walmer Castle. In a few days Wallace, the master of the Customs House Cutter, received orders from government to give the lugger and her smuggled cargo up on penalty of being dismissed the service and these cases of smuggled goods were afterwards delivered at the Prime Minister's Mr. Pitt at Walmer Castle. Mr. Editor, read what follows, and repress your indignation if you can. There are now in Deal Jail fourteen persons for trifling acts of smuggling, compared to the above of the Right Honorable William Pitt and the now Right Honorable Lord Melville. The former were poor, and knew not how to live. The latter were most affluently and splendidly supported by the people, that is, they were paupers upon the generous public, towards whom they thus scandalously and infamously conducted themselves. I am, sir, your humble servant, Cleo Rickman. To those opponents of Thomas Paine who attach any weight to his dismissal from the excise on suspicion of smuggling, we would mention the fact that during Paine's service at Lewis, Mr. Jenner, the principal clerk in the Excise Office, London, wrote several letters from the Board of Excise, thanking Mr. Payne for his assiduity in his profession and for his information and calculations forwarded to the office. Shortly after his dismissal, Mr. Payne and his wife, by mutual agreement, separated. Many tales have been put in circulation respecting the separation. Cleo Rickman, in his Life of Pain, has the following passage. That he did not cohabit with her from the moment they left the altar till the day of their separation, a space of three years, although they lived in the same house together, is an indisputable truth. It is also true that no physical defect on the part of Mr. Payne can be adduced as a reason for such conduct. Mr. Payne's answer upon my once referring to the subject was, it is nobody's business but my own. I had cause for it, but I will name it to no one. This I can assert, that Mr. Payne always spoke tenderly and respectfully of his wife, and sent her several times pecuniary aid, without her knowing even whence it came. In 1774 Payne left England, and arrived at Philadelphia a few months before the Battle of Lexington. He made his appearance in the New World as editor of the Pennsylvanian magazine, and it would appear that he then had in view the coming struggle, in which he took so prominent a part, for in his introduction to the first number of the above magazine he states, 
Thus encompassed with difficulties, this first number of the Pennsylvanian Magazine entreats a favorable reception, of which we shall only say that, like the early snowdrop, it comes forth in a barren season, and contends itself with foretelling the reader that choicer flowers are preparing to appear. Upon the foreign supply of gunpowder being prohibited, he proposed a plan, in the Pennsylvania Journal, of a saltpeter association for the voluntary supply of that article of destruction. On the 10th of January, 1776, Common Sense was published, its circulation soon reaching 100,000 copies. The effect this remarkable pamphlet produced upon the minds of the American people, and the share it had in bringing to a successful issue the then pending struggle may be gathered even from Paine's bitterest enemies. Mr. Cheatham, in his Life of Paine, while endeavoring to damage the author of Common Sense, admits the value of this pamphlet. He says, This pamphlet of forty octavo pages, holding out relief by proposing independence to an oppressed and despairing people, was published in January 1776, speaking a language which the colonists had felt but not thought of. Its popularity, terrible in its consequences to the parent country, was unexampled in the history of the press. At first involving the colonists in the crime of rebellion, and pointing to a road leading inevitably to ruin, it was read with indignation and alarm. But when the reader, and every one read it, recovering from the first shock, re-perused it, its arguments nourishing his feelings and appealing to his pride reanimated his hopes and satisfied his understanding that common sense, backed by the resources and force of the colonies, poor and feeble as they were, could alone rescue them from the unqualified oppression with which they were threatened. The unknown author, in the moments of enthusiasm which succeeded, was an angel sent from heaven to save from all the horrors of slavery by his timely, powerful, and unerring counsels a faithful but abused, a brave but misrepresented people. Another of Paine's enemies and slanderers, Elkanah Watson, in a volume recently published entitled Men and Times of the Revolution, after speaking in very disparaging terms of Paine's appearance, habits, and disposition, which is proved false by the best of testimony, admits the service rendered to America by common sense. He says, Yet I could not repress the deepest emotions of gratitude toward him, as the instrument of providence in accelerating the declaration of our independence. He certainly was a prominent agent in preparing the public sentiment of America for that glorious event. The idea of independence had not occupied the popular mind, and when guardedly approached on the topic it shrunk from the conception as fraught with doubt, with peril, and with suffering. In 1776 I was present at Providence, Rhode Island, in a social assembly of most of the prominent leaders of the state. I recollect that the subject of independence was cautiously introduced by an ardent Whig, and the thought seemed to excite the abhorrence of the whole circle. A few weeks after, Paine's common sense appeared, and passed through the continent like an electric spark. It everywhere flashed conviction and aroused a determined spirit, which resulted in the Declaration of Independence upon the Fourth of July ensuing. The name of Paine was precious to every Whig heart, and had resounded throughout Europe. Other testimony could be given to Paine's influence in the American struggle for independence, but after the two already mentioned from his opponents, it is unnecessary to give further proof. In the same year that common sense appeared, Paine accompanied General Washington and his army, being with him in his retreat from Hudson River to the Delaware. Although great terror prevailed, Paine stood brave and undismayed, conscious he was advocating a just cause and determined to bring it to a successful issue. He occupied himself in inspiring hope in the Americans, showing them their strength and their weakness. This object drew from his pen the crisis, a continuation of the common sense, which was issued at intervals till the cessation of hostilities. In 1777, Paine was unanimously, and unknown to himself, appointed secretary in the Foreign Department, where he formed a close friendship with Dr. Franklin. 
He did not retain his office, however, long, as he refused to become a party to the fraudulent demands of a Mr. Silas Dean, one of the American commissioners, then in Europe, and he resigned the office. In 1780 he was chosen member of the American Philosophical Society, having previously received the degree of Master of Arts from the University of Philadelphia. When the independence of America was attained, and when oppression had received a severe and lasting check in that rising country, we find that Paine, so far from being satisfied with his success in the new world, began to look for a fresh field where he might render good service to the cause of right and freedom. Accordingly, in 1787 he visited Paris, his famous services to America giving him a welcome by those who knew the benefit arising from the establishment of human rights. His stay in Paris at this time was of short duration, as he returned to England after an absence of thirteen years on September 3rd. After visiting his mother and settling an allowance of nine shillings per week for her support, he resided for a short time at Rotherham in Yorkshire where an iron bridge was cast and erected upon a model of his invention, which obtained him great reputation for his mathematical skill. The publication of Mr. Burke's Reflections on the French Revolution called from Paine his Rights of Man, a book that created great attraction and sold nearly a million and a half copies. In politics Paine was clear and decided, and from his moderation what is called sound, for the perusal of those who may not have read it, we give the following quotations to show the principles upon which it is based. Mr. Burke talks about what he calls an hereditary crown, as if it were some production of nature, or as if, like time, it had a power to operate, not only independently, but in spite of man, or as if it were a thing or a subject universally consented to. Alas! It has none of those properties, but is the reverse of them all. It is a thing in imagination, the property of which is more than doubted, and the legality of which in a few years will be denied. But to arrange this matter in a clearer view than what general expressions can convey, it will be necessary to state the distinct heads under which what is called an hereditary crown, or more properly speaking an hereditary succession to the government of a nation can be considered, which are, first, the right of a particular family to establish itself, secondly, the right of a nation to establish a particular family, with respect to the first of these heads, that of a family establishing itself with hereditary powers on its own authority, and independent of the consent of a nation, all men will concur in calling it despotism, and it would be trespassing on their understanding to attempt to prove it. But the second head, that of a nation establishing a particular family with hereditary powers, does not present itself as despotism on the first reflection. But if men will permit a second reflection to take place, and carry that reflection forward but one remove out of their own persons to that of their offspring, they will then see that hereditary succession becomes in its consequences the same despotism to others which they reprobated for themselves. It operates to preclude the consent of the succeeding generations, and the preclusion of consent is despotism. When the person who at any time shall be in possession of a government, or those who stand in succession to him, shall say to a nation, I hold this power in contempt of you. It signifies not on what authority he pretends to say it. It is no relief but an aggravation to a person in slavery to reflect that he was sold by his parent, and as that which heightens the criminality of an act cannot be produced to prove the legality of it, hereditary succession cannot be established as a legal thing. Notwithstanding the taxes of England amount to almost seventeen millions a year, said to be for the expenses of government. It is still evident that the sense of the nation is left to govern itself by magistrates and jurors, almost at its own charge on republican principles, exclusive of the expense of taxes. The salaries of the judges are almost the only charge that is paid out of the revenue. Considering that all the internal government is executed by the people, the taxes of England ought to be the lightest of any nation in Europe. 
instead of which they are the contrary. As this cannot be accounted for on the score of civil government, the subject necessarily extends itself to the monarchial part. If a law be bad, it is one thing to expose the practice of it, but it is quite a different thing to expose its errors, to reason on its defects, and show cause why it should be repealed, or why another ought to be substituted in its place. I have always held it an opinion, making it also my practice, that it is better to obey a bad law, making use at the same time of every argument to show its errors and procure its repeal, than forcibly to violate it, because the precedent of breaking a bad law might weaken the force and lead to a discretionary violation of those which are good. As may be supposed, such a work as The Rights of Man, aiming directly at all oppression, regardless of party, could not be allowed to escape the Attorney General's answer. Accordingly, we find a prosecution instituted against it. But instead of prosecuting the author, the publishers were selected. This drew from Payne a long letter to the Attorney General suggesting the justice of his answering for the book he wrote. On the trial, Mr afterwards Lord Erskine, thus spoke of the author of The Rights of Man. The defendant's hold to portment previous to the publication has been wholly unexceptionable. He properly desires to be given up as the author of the book, if any inquiry should take place concerning it, and he is not affected in evidence, directly or indirectly, with any legal or suspicious conduct not even with uttering an indiscreet or taunting expression, nor with any one matter or thing inconsistent with the best subject in England. On the 12th of September, 1792, Mr. Achilles Odebert came expressly to England from the French Convention to solicit Payne to attend and aid them by his advice in their deliberations. On his arrival at Calais a public dinner was provided. A royal salute was fired from the battery, the troops were drawn out, and there was a general rejoicing throughout the town. Payne was escorted to the house of his friend Mr. Odebert, the chief magistrate of the place, where he was visited by the commandant and all the municipal officers in forms, who afterwards gave him a sumptuous entertainment in the town hall. The same honor was also paid him on his departure for Paris. Upon his arrival in Paris all was confusion. There were the king's friends mortified and subdued. The Jacobeans split up into cavilling factions, some wishing a federative government, some desiring the king's death and the death of all the nobility, while a portion were more discreet, wishing liberty without licentiousness, and having a desire to redress wrongs without revenge. These few accepted Payne as their leader, and renounced all connection with the Jacobean club. Payne on all occasions advocated the preservation of the king's life, but his efforts were thwarted by the appointment of Robespierre of Barere to office. So anxiously was Payne sought after that both Calais and Versailles returned him as deputy, to show how the author of The Rights of Man opposed all physical force where reason may be used, it is only necessary to state that when the letter of Du Maurier reached Paris with the threat of restoring the king, Payne wrote a letter to the convention, stating a plan for readjustment, and was taking it personally when he was informed that a decree had just been passed offering one hundred thousand crowns for Du Maurier's head and another making it high treason to propose anything in his favor. Whilst deputy for Calais, Payne was sought and admired by all classes. He dined every Friday for a long period with the Earl of Lauderdale and Dr. Moore, and so frequent were his visitors that he set apart two mornings a week for his levy days. He soon, however, changed his residence, preferring less formality and a more select circle. His history of the French Revolution we are deprived of by his imprisonment, which Gibbon thought would prove a great loss. The historian often applied for the manuscript, believing it to be of great worth. The opinion Payne held of the Revolution may be gathered from the following. With respect to the Revolution, it was begun by good men on good principles, and I have ever believed it would have gone on so had not the provocative interference of foreign powers distracted it into madness and sown jealousies among the leaders. The people of England have now two revolutions, the American and the French before them. 
their own wisdom will direct them what to choose and what to avoid and in everything which relates to their happiness combined with the common good of mankind i wish them honor and success his speech against the death of the king shows how far he was removed from party spirit or any feeling of revenge whilst he protested against the king being re-enthroned he equally protested against his death wishing him removed from the seat of his corruption and placed in a more elevating atmosphere entreating for the king's safety he says let then the united states be the safeguard and the asylum of louis capet there hereafter far removed from the miseries and crimes of royalty he may learn from the constant aspect of public prosperity that the true system of government consists in fair equal and honorable representation in relating this circumstance and in submitting this proposition i consider myself as a citizen of both countries the policy pursued by Paine was not consistent with the views of Robespierre. Consequently, he was seized in the night and imprisoned in Luxembourg eleven months, without any reason being assigned. The readers are doubtless aware of the many providential escapes he had from the death for which he was seized. While in prison he wrote part of his Age of Reason, having commenced it just previous to his arrest not knowing one hour but he might be executed and once being on the verge of death from fever he knew the prejudice the age of reason would create so he left its production to the latter part of his life not wishing to make that an impediment to the good he sought to accomplish in the political world after toiling in france to bring the revolution to a just termination and finding his efforts rendered abortive by that feeling which former oppression had created he resolved to return to America, a country he saw thriving by a policy he wished to institute in France. In 1802, Jefferson, then President of America, knowing his wish to return, wrote him the following letter. You express a wish in your letter to return to America by a national ship. Mr. Dawson, who brings over the treaty, and who will present you with this letter, is charged with orders to the captain of the Maryland to receive and accommodate you back if you can be ready to return at such a short warning. You will in general find us return to sentiments worthy of former times. In these it will be your glory to have steadily labored, and with as much effect as any man living. That you may live long to continue your useful labors and reap the reward in the thankfulness of nations is my sincere prayer. Accept the assurance of my high esteem and affectionate attachment, Thomas Jefferson. But circumstances prevented Payne going by the Maryland. He sailed, however, on the 1st of September, 1802, in the London Paquette. He had often previously arranged to return to America, but luckily Providence prevented him. One ship that he intended to sail by was searched by English frigates for Thomas Payne, and another sunk at sea whilst at other times British frigates were cruising off the ports from which he was to sail, knowing him to be there. So much religious misrepresentation has been circulated about Paine's life and death that it becomes a duty to restate the facts. The manner of life Paine pursued may be gathered from the reliable testimony of Cleo Rickman. He says, Mr. Paine's life in London was a quiet round of philosophical leisure and enjoyment. It was occupied in writing, in a small epistolary correspondence, in walking about with me to visit different friends, occasionally lounging at coffee-houses and public places, or being visited by a select few. Lord Edward Fitzgerald, the French and American ambassadors, Mr. Sharp the engraver, Romney the painter, Mrs. Wollstonecraft, Joel Barlow, Mr. Hull, Mr. Christie, Dr. Priestley, Dr. Towers, Colonel Oswald, the walking steward. Captain Sampson Perry, Mr. Tuffin, Mr. William Choppin, Captain de Stark, Mr. Home Took, etc., were among the number of his friends and acquaintances. His manner of living in France and America has already been noticed. The perverted tales of Carver and Cheatham may be utterly disproved by referring to Cleo Rickman's life of pain. As his life, so was his death. When he became feeble and infirm in January 1809, he was often visited by those good people, who so often intrude upon the domestic quiet of the afflicted. After the visit of an old woman, come from the Almighty, 
whom Payne soon sent back again. He was troubled with the Reverend Mr. Millidollar and the Reverend Mr. Cunningham. The latter Reverend said, Mr. Payne, we visit you as friends and neighbors. You have now a full view of death. You cannot live long, and whoever does not believe in Jesus Christ will assuredly be damned. Let me, said Payne, have none of your popish stuff. Get away with you. Good morning. Good morning. Another visitor was the Reverend Mr. Hargrove, with this statement. My name is Hargrove, sir. I am minister of the New Jerusalem Church. We, sir, explain the scripture in its true meaning. The key has been lost these four thousand years, and we have found it. Then, said Payne in his own neat way, it must have been very rusty. Shortly before his death he stated to Mr. Hicks, to whom he had sent to arrange his burial, that his sentiments in reference to the Christian religion were precisely the same as when he wrote The Age of Reason. On the 8th of June, in the words of Cleo Rickman, 1809, about nine in the morning, he placidly and almost without a struggle died as he had lived, a deist, aged seventy-two years and five months. He was interred at New Rochelle upon his own farm, a handsome monument being now erected where he was buried. It has been the object in the present sketch, rather to give, in a brief manner, an account of Payne's life and services than an elucidation of his writings. His works are well known, and they will speak for themselves, but much wrong is done to his memory by the perversions and misrepresentations of the religious publications. No doubt, had his views been different on religious subjects, he would have been held up as a model of genius, perseverance, courage, disinterestedness of purpose, and purity of life by the men who now find him no better name than the blasphemer. We hope that those not previously acquainted with the facts of life will find in the present sketch sufficient reason to think and speak otherwise of a man who made the world his country, and the doing of good his religion. As Euclid nears his various writings shown, his pen inspired by glorious truth alone, o'er all the earth diffusing light and life, subduing error, ignorance, and strife, raised man to just pursuits, to thinking right, and yet will free the world from woe and falsehood's night. To this immortal man, to pain, t'was given, to metamorphose earth, from hell to heaven. End of Thomas Paine by John Watts